Very good day to you all. I trust that you have had a wonderful Christmas time and spent quality time with family and friends and that you also made time to celebrate the reason that we have this time to remember our Lord and King Jesus Christ coming to this world. Let us ask God's blessing as we again today open His Word and read from it and uh, let's ask his holy spirit to guide us let's pray heavenly father we thank you for being together in your name thank you for the for your word and we ask you humbly open your word in our minds and hearts bring us to understanding and also to do what we learn from it enlighten our minds we praise you and we bring worship to your to your name amen we're still in the time of advent where we as church would like to remember as we have said the coming of our lord jesus to this world and what its implications are for mankind we find two records of the birth of Jesus in the Gospels and specifically then in Matthew and in Luke. It is most interesting to note that the two records 
have different materials grouped and selected and that they complement each other. We know that Matthew was writing to a Jewish audience whom he wants to show that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus was promised the Messiah throughout the scriptures that we call today the Old Testament. Matthew tells us the birth narrative from the perspective of the genealogy line of Joseph. Joseph was the adopted father of Jesus and that shows the legal royal status of Jesus. A king is born in a Jewish kingly family. It starts off with Abraham the father of the people of Israel then runs through David the great king who is a type of the Messiah. Matthew also takes for granted that his readers being Jews would understand the idioms of speech of the Jews and that they would be acquainted with their customs. Luke, at the other hand, is writing to Theophilus, an honored Roman official that was probably located in Rome and he was Greek-speaking and he knew very little about the Jews and their ways. Thus, the Gospel of Luke is written to a Gentile audience and often clarifies matters in the history a bit more. We find it interesting that Luke's nativity story is told from the side of Mary and the biological lineage of Jesus. Both Joseph and Mary were from the line of David of the tribe of Judah. Luke starts with Jesus and went all the way back to Adam. Why? Is it because Adam is the ancestor to the whole human race, the whole world, and not only the Jews? Remember, Luke writes to share the gospel with people from other nations called Gentiles or heathens. Why is Matthew then reporting of the wise men of the East? rather than Luke, because Matthew, we've just said that he's writing for Jews and he would like to share the gospel with Jews. And why does he then, why is he then the one that includes the story, the history of the wise men coming from the East who were not Jews, but Gentiles? This is an interesting question to ask, don't you think? And why would these Gentiles come to visit a king born to the Jews? To answer these questions, we would like to speak today about the wise men from the East. Who were they? And what message may we take from their visit? Let us now read our scripture in Matthew 2 from verse 1 to 12. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, 
But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when, we, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back the word to me, that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Let us see if we may determine who these wise men or magi were. What is their identity? The text reads, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Let's look at the map of the east at the time of Jesus. You may see it on the screen right now, a map of Parthia. The green uh, part at the left is the Roman Empire under whose rule Israel was at that time. The red zone was Israel itself with adjacent areas slightly to the east and the north. And that red area formed sort of a buffer between the Roman Empire in the west and their opposition, the Parthian Empire of the east, the yellow part. The east had regions like Parthia, Media, Persia, Babylonia, Mesopotamia and the Arabic Peninsula. Please don't confuse Mesopotamia with Macedonia. Mesopotamia is in the east and it means between rivers and refers to the land between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, Euphrates. Macedonia, of course, is Greece in the west. It immediately should strike us that the east concerns the people of Israel in their history. Why? Well, Abram was called from ancient Ur of the Chaldeans, which is Babylonia territory. And it might even be that the wise men also originally came from there, from Ur of the Chaldeans. Besides that, we know that the northern ten tribes of Israel were taken into exile by the Assyrians, which were a Mesopotamian kingdom. This happened about 721 before Christ. And about 100 years after this event, the two southern tribes called Judah was taken into exile by Babylon. Now we may wonder what the influence of the Israelites would have been on these nations where they were taken into. We would find information about this in the Bible itself, for example in the book of Daniel quite a lot and other prophets as well. And then also, interestingly, from secular historians. We can learn quite a bit there as well. The wise men or magi um, were known as a priestly political class of Parthians. In history, we were told that the, they were magi in the 7th century before Christ. And they were then a tribe in eastern Mesopotamia among the Medes and the Persians. The wise men 
were scientists in an era where science was not opposed to seeking God and investigating more about God. Therefore, the Magi were sincere individuals. They were trying to really figure things out. They were very serious and sincere, as we have said. You can imagine you don't travel for such a long length of of space. It's about more than just over a thousand kilometers they had to travel from the east to reach Jerusalem. You don't do that just for fun and games. Uh, taking along a lot of animals and tents and your whole package, it's a huge effort. You must be very serious and sincere to undertake such a huge effort. These wise men had good general knowledge of science, agriculture, mathematics, history, astronomy, astrology, and even the occult. They had a growing religious and political influence that continued and therefore they became prominent and they were a powerful group of advisors to kings in the Babylonian and after the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire. They were especially also acknowledged for their ability to interpret dreams. Maybe it would be a challenge to learn that they might have been involved in astrology and sorcery. Why are they portrayed as coming to look for the Messiah and bring honor to him as they seem to practice things that the scriptures clearly forbid. Of course, the fact that they are including, uh, included in visiting Jesus and recognizing him as the Messiah King doesn't sanction a proof of any of these wrong practices that they might have been involved in. That encourages us, e us even more to try to determine why Matthew mentions their visit to his Jewish audience. Let us see if we may read more about them in the Bible. We read in the book of Daniel that some young Jewish men of Jerusalem, Daniel and his friends, they were fine men among the first group that went into exile into Babylon about in the year 605 before Jesus Christ. <coughs> then we read in Daniel 1 verse 3 to 4 that King Nebuchadnezzar was looking for some of the children of Israel, these young men. Uh, he was looking for good, without blemish, good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand young men who had the ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and the literature of the Chaldeans, a group of kingly advisors. And we read now um, what exactly it says in Daniel 1 verse 3 to 4. Then the king instructed Asphanas to bring some of the children of Israel, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had the ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they had, they might teach the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. Later on in Daniel 1 verse 17, we also read, As for these young men, God gave them, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. So God used this um, office, as we may call it, of the wise men to employ or deploy some of his own godly men, Daniel and his friends. They themselves became wise men, magi in the East. Very interesting. Here was an opportunity 
that God himself opened up. Some of this, these bright young men of Israel were chosen to become wise men in the East and be part of the king's advisors in the time of the Babylonian Empire. And Daniel and his friends were godly men and their involvement in this sphere was ordained by God and must have left an impact on the wise men or the magi of the East forever after this time. We read even more about these kingly advisors, the wise men of whom God appointed Daniel, a godly man, as their leader in Daniel 2. We read verse 1 to 3. Now, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. Maybe collectively we may name them the wise men or the magi. You can see that Chaldeans are mentioned as a group here as well. So they came and stood before the king and the king said to them, I have had the dream and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Now, can you imagine and start to imagine how the thinking of these Magi of the East must have been shaped by Daniel and other godly Jews that were in exile in Babylon? We read later how even King Nebuchadnezzar was moved towards God himself. Still later, when the Babylonian Empire fell to the Medes and the Persians and became, of course, the Persian Empire. The involvement of these wise men in making and the advising kings continued. Have you heard what I said? They were involved in making kings, in, in crowning kings. Kings were prepared by them. We read in Daniel 6, in the time of the Persian Empire, Empire, the king uh, there was King Darius, the following, Daniel 6, verse 8 to 9. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius, king Darius signed the written decree. Now we can see it's the time of Cyrus and Darius the time of the Persian Empire and it is Daniel and his friends are still mentioned but what we need to take note of here is the mention of the law of the Medes and the Persians and even today it's a familiar term that is used. Um, it is reckoned that this law of the Medes and the Persians was founded on the te te teachings of these wise men, the Magi. From history we see that for a Persian to become a king, he must master the scientific and religious discipline, disciplines of the Magi. And only then could he be, be approved and crowned by, by the Magi, by them. Uh, that is what is meant with the law of the Medes and the Persians. It is actually the law of the wise men or the Magi. Therefore, the wise men can be called king makers. How interesting it is that God would use earthly king makers from the Gentile nations to crown the heavenly king here on earth. In Jeremiah 39, we also read something very interesting. We must remember that Jeremiah was a prophet in Judah before, during and after its fall to Babylon in 586 BC. We read in Jeremiah that when Jerusalem was besieged by King Nebuchadnezzar, some of his princes 
were there in this military operation as well. We read about a person called Nergal Sarizer. He is referred to in the text as the Rat Mag. Can you hear Mag? Mag, Magi. Some suggest that Rat Mag is the chief of the Babylonian Magi or chief of priests. Here it is mentioned that this wise man was with King Nebuchadnezzar when he attacked and conquered Judah and took the people there into Israel, uh, into exile. It was the first capture. Now let's read this text, uh, verse 1 to 3 from Jeremiah 39. In the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and besieged it. Then all the heads or princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat in the middle gate. Nergal Sharizer, Samgar Nebu, Sarsichem, Rapsaris, the chief of the eunuchs, Nergal Sharizer, Rapmak, chief of the Magi, and all the rest of the heads, princes of the king of Babylon. And we can see how the Magi were supporting the kings in their operations, besides even helping to select and advise them. An important group of people, these Magi. Thus, we learn from the book of Daniel that the Magi or wise men were among the highest ranking officials in Babylon. They were surely noble people. They were thus very important and noble men. They were involved in the crowning of kings. And our Matthew text tells us that they were involved what we then may describe as the earthly crowning of our King of Kings, of Jesus. How amazing it is that our God is so involved in unfolding history. Now we have identified these wise men somewhat. Let us move on and we need now to determine the following. How did it come that these wise men were expecting the birth of a king for the world at this time? Well, the very fact that they expect the king to come, but also the time in which they expect him to come. How did they know? Let us look. Their inquiry to the people of Jerusalem, uh, we have read in, in Matthew 2, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? These wise men had come to the conviction that a significant king had been born. That this king was directly related to the Jewish people and this king had been born in Judea. That is what we may deduct from this uh, phrase of the text that I've just read. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Now we see that Israel were scattered through the nations with um, the exiles of the northern ten tribes to Assyria and the southern two tribes to Babylon. And with this scattering, one may deduct that it is also the Messianic expectation that the Jews had that were taken, the knowledge thereof that was taken to the nations and also scattered among the nations. This insight in um, these, in the expectation of the Messiah that was to come. How could the time of the arrival of the king be known then? Let's look in scripture and we read in the, in the setting where Jacob, Israel, was blessing his sons. That we read in Genesis 49 verse 10, the prophecy about Judah. Verse 10, the scepter 
will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Silo comes, that means he to whom it belongs comes, and the obedience of the nations is his. A setter betrays the rule of a king. And thus this prophecy is saying there will always be a ruler on the throne of the tribe of Judah. And that is the line through David up to the Messiah. Until, of course, the Messiah comes and to him the, the throne actually belongs and, and his kingdom will be everlasting. So there, there, there would not be a gap in the lineage from David that would be installed as king in Judah, in Israel. Now something interesting happened in the history and we find in the biblical record, um, we can see then that the king always was from the tribe of Judah that governed the southern kingdom. And this, the setter did for a long time not depart from Judah, but until about 40 years before the birth of Christ. What happened then? This was when the Romans who had conquered the world, and they took over from the Grecian Empire uh, to establish the Roman Empire. Um, they installed a king for the Jews on their behalf. And that person was an Edomite, not a Jew. And his name is King Herod the Great. Now you can imagine when Herod the Great became the ruler in Israel about 40 years before Christ's birth, that some of the Jewish rabbis at that time noted that, wow, it seemed that indeed the scepter now departed from Judah. What is happening to this prophecy? And this was a huge alarm. And it signaled at that time that the coming of the Messiah could be at hand. And there was an expectation, among some at least, that the Messiah King would be born within that generation. Interestingly, in Jewish thinking, the length of a generation is uh, deemed as 40 years. And uh, as you've already heard, 40 years later, the Messiah was born indeed. So the prophecy was fulfilled. Just for the sake of interest, Jesus, when he was teaching his disciples and they asked him about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, he said that not one stone would be left upon another and then they said what the sign would be and, and, and what the time was that this would happen. And one of the things that he said that this generation would not pass before that happened. And you know, Jesus uh, was uh, crucified and he resurrected 40 years before that happened. It was in the year 30 and in the year 70, exactly 40 years, Jerusalem fell. Again, he just made it in one generation, like the same we saw here. Um, a second prophecy that may have caused the Jews and therefore the Gentiles around them as well, uh, who knew of their expectation to think that the Messiah would come at this particular point in time, is a, another prophecy given in Daniel chapter 9. It is called the prophecy of the 70 year weeks and we read let's read Daniel 9 uh, verse 25 now therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks now the whole passage is from 24 verse 24 to 27 um, you might read it on your own but what we need to say here is that the terms, the term weeks in this prophecy means periods of seven. It, it literally means sevens. The word there means sevens. And it is regarded as periods of seven years, so-called year weeks. Thus, 69 sevens or year weeks is 483 years. 
in total in this whole prophecy 490 years are in view now it says that it would begin by the decree of king cyrus of persia that of course um, they can go and rebuild the the temple and restore the walls of Jerusalem but they were given three degrees in total so there's a little bit of confusion exactly which decree to start off with but it's close enough and amidst certain uncertainties approximately it will take you to the time of Jesus therefore it could be calculated um, and, and coincide with what we have just mentioned about Herod that took the scepter that departed now from Judah. It all boils down to this time that there was need, there was the need to have a huge alert for Jesus' coming. And some, unfortunately, more outside of, of Jerusalem picked it up and not the scribes and Pharisees necessarily so much. Now, um, remember the, the writings of Daniel were available to these wise men you know long after the time of Daniel they, they kept their his writings and, and he was a well respected person in their midst he was a, a leader for them in a, in a quite lengthy period of time uh, being scientists these wise men would be able to calculate the time of the coming of the Messiah from this prophecy of the 70 year weeks alone and they could come very very close uh, uh, depending on how accurately they, they were calculating. But of, actually, what he said is the scribes, the priests and the Pharisees in Jerusalem were also supposed to do these calculations and to determine this time. But it seems that they were occupied with themselves and were indifferent to the Messiah's coming. And what a contrary, what a contrast are these sincere seeking gentile wise men who were following a little light from the scriptures that they had but they were so sincere and so humble and they reached their goal in the end on another occasion daniel saved the lives of the wise men you can remember nebuchadnezzar had a dream and he wouldn't even tell the advisors the dream but they had to tell it for him and and he, he was going to kill all of them that were then fake and couldn't tell him the, the dream and its interpretation. And Daniel stepped forward and with God's help, of course, Daniel rescued the, the wise men. And let, let us read this dream because here there's also mention of a superior kingdom to come so there are different indicators of what was going to happen and all of them work together Daniel 2 verse 27 and 28 Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said the secret which the king has demanded the wise men the astrologers the magicians and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. And in the days, verse 44, and in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. This is the interpretation that God gave through Daniel. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. This and Daniel's um, telling the dream and inter interpreting it must have made a huge impact among these wise men in the East. Daniel then became their leader and he testified about God and his prophecies the god of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed daniel was always looking forward to a day when the saints of the most high 
will receive and possess a kingdom that will be forever and ever. And this kingdom, the fact that there is a kingdom to come, imply that there is a king to come with that kingdom. Now we've already mentioned how Daniel became the leader of these Magi. What an what a, a incredible position and honor for a godly man from Israel. Uh, he also became prime minister under Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, we read Daniel 5 verse 11 and which says, and King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him, Daniel, chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. That just testify with what I've said. Besides getting direct insights from God, Daniel also had scripture where he must have read the prophecy of Balaam, even uh, a long time even before himself, about 800 years before Christ. And we read about this prophecy and remember Balaam was also a Gentile person that came across the Israelites. Um, we read in Numbers 24, the 16 and 17, Balaam was probably also an astrologer, and might be even a precursor to these wise men. But God showed him, him who is a Gentile, things that were to come. And this is a huge prophecy. The 16 and 17, the utterance of him who hears the words of God and has the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of Timot. Here two things are mentioned. A star would come from Israel. Does that sound familiar? In context with a wise man. A ruler will come out of Israel. Both the, through scriptures and by divine revelation, Daniel knew a remarkable king was to come. And the wise men respected Daniel and they took note of, of what he said. And what he taught. This is some of the information that these wise men with their inquiring minds have had to put together. They were looking for the true God. They were seeking. And what did God say again in, in Jeremiah 29 verse 13? And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart and I will be fine I'll be found by you says the Lord seek me and find me if you do it with all your heart sincerely these wise men were indeed sincerely looking and seeking they did an extraordinary thing to travel such a long distance through deserts from the Perthian Persian Empire to the hostile Roman Empire in their quest to find the promised king. But all the mentioned information was circulating as rumors wide among the whole Gentile world, including even in the, in the West where the Roman Empire was. And you must also realize that we indeed have accounts outside of the Bible of this expectation. And that is what we are going to look at now. So we, we have dealt with, with the biblical uh, prophecies and expectations that were raised and were carried over from the Jews to the Gentiles in exile. And it was picked up and proof of that, that it was picked up 
I have three examples here among Gentiles and what they had to say as well. Um, during that time, there was also then the Roman historian Suetonius. And let's hear what he had to say. And he was speaking of the time around the birth of Christ. And he wrote, There had spread over all the Orient an and old and established belief that it was fated at that time for men coming from Judea to rule the world. Have you heard? This is coming from the Roman press. Not the Jews, not the Bible. The Roman press. An expectation about the coming of a king to rule the world from Judah. Have they only understood what it really meant and that it was actually a spiritual kingdom? Well, there was another historian, Tacitus, and he wrote that there was a firm persu persuasion that at this very time the East was to grow powerful and rulers coming from Judea were to, to acquire a universal empire. Can you hear this? Also from a Roman historian, Tacitus, there was a firm belief that the East was going to grow powerful and rulers from Judea would acquire a universal empire. Also among the Jews out of, out of the Bible, the famous Jewish historian Josephus, he reports in his writings, The Wars of the Jews, that at about the time of Christ's birth, the Jews believed that one from their country would soon become ruler of the habitable earth. Now these wise men from the East also was aware of this general worldwide expectation. And they, the wise men, had investigative inquiring minds the fact that they made such a huge and costly effort, as we have already pointed out, may just tell us how sincere they were, but also that they were not arrogant in their thinking, but they were humble men and they were sincere people. With this information, we have now a better understanding of who these wise men were and how they could have a general who could have had a general idea of when and where the king would come and how this king would impact the world, even though they might not have understood the nitty-gritty of the implications of this. But they had this general insight. But now, what would be the specific trigger that the time was at hand, the time has arrived, because something else need to happen for them to pack up their camels and set off to Jerusalem. What was that? Following that star, this is the title of the next section, it's actually following his star. Matthew 2 verse 2, for we have seen his star, the Magi said, in the east. While they were in the east, they saw a star, a bright appearance in the sky. And they have come to worship the king. They took it, they connected this appearance in the sky from afar. That, that was the time for all the knowledge that they've already had about the coming of the king. They, they added two and two together, as we say. Now they saw something in the sky and they described it as a star. Um, they, like we said, deducted that that was related to the king that was prophesied and that this king they knew was to be born in Israel and they knew it was going to be Judah. So they didn't need actually the star from the east to take them 
to Jerusalem. And, and the star also didn't take them all the long. They, they just saw it and then they packed their stuff and they off they go. But later on they would encounter this uh, appearance in the sky once again. But it wasn't, we, we sometimes have the impression that it was there all, all, all the way with them, but it was not so. Uh, it just had to set them off on their journey. And they worked out that they had to go to Jerusalem where the palace of the king was because they would uh, just reason that it was a king to be born there for it must be at the king's palace. Uh, at the king's palace. Little did they know that that was a mistake that they made. However, the star then, as we have said, didn't remain up in the sky. It only appeared much later again. Only after they had spoken to King Herod. And King Herod had to consult the priests because he didn't know. And um, the priests and the scribes, they knew something about the scripture and they could now give them more guidance, but it actually was coming from scriptures, uh, which we'll read later. But um, in Matthew 2 verse 9 and 10, we, we, we read now again, And behold, the star which they had seen in the east now went before them. That is after they had spoken to Herod and the priests and the Pharisees and scribes. Only now the star went again before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, of course it, it wasn't all the way uh, visible to them until now. We can say they saw the star again. Now they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Now they know this indication that will guide them suddenly appeared again. The supernatural guidance which they called a star. But what they described as a star is not necessarily an astronomical star high up there in the sky. Real stars don't usually come down to hang just above a house or just make its appearance above the heads of the camels or something like that. They remain quite high up in the sky. So how do you link from up there the line to which house it was? Um, and this, of course, this star or this appearance is a supernatural light that God made to appear, to guide them, a, a type of Shekinah glory, a bright shining that even an angel can be involved with. It, it need not to be literally an astronomical star or like some would say there was this conjunction between some planets. We need not to go along that line necessarily. Star may be used figuratively to represent any great brilliance or radiance. We know that the Messiah is often spoken of as a star that shall come forth from Jacob. Could it be that the Shekinah glory of God stood over Bethlehem? Just as centuries before it had stood over the tabernacle in the wilderness. And just as the pillar of cloud gave light to Israel, but darkness to Egypt. In Exodus 14.20, only the eyes of the Magi, the wise men, might have been opened to see God's great light over Bethlehem. Maybe no one else saw that. We are not told that detail. But we know from elsewhere in Scripture, if we compare Scripture with Scripture, there is more than one situation like this. I mean, Paul on the road to Damascus, not everyone saw that light appear as well, but Paul. And, and Jesus appeared to him in this bright light. Now, um, we also find in Isaiah, Isaiah a messianic passage where it is prophesied that the Gentiles from all over the world would come into the kingdom of God. That sounds that in the time of the Magi, the wise men, 
they might be the first fulfillment of this prophecy who, who later would continue in the in the time of the age that we are in the time of the church now in, in Isaiah's prophecy it speaks of the glory of the Lord that would shine are these wise men seeking seeing the glory of the Lord in more than one way is their visit the beginning of the fulfillment of this prophecy if I say in more than one way the physical appearance of the glory in the star but also the um, metaphor in the light that Jesus was bringing to the world in a deeper way, in a spiritual way. And then the wise men might be the first fulfillment of this prophecy of Isaiah. We will read it just now. Listen to how this prophecy also fit the visit of these wise men, which also will continue the fulfillment of that prophecy through the age of the church in a metaphoric symbolic way let's read it now isaiah 60 verse 1 to 3 and also verse 6 is very familiar we even sing about this arise shine for your light has come and the glory of the lord is risen upon you you can even imagine the Bethlehem star arise shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you for behold the darkness shall cover the earth during this time there's still darkness but now there's light as well and the deep darkness the people but the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you the Gentiles shall come to your light. The wise men were Gentiles indeed. And kings to the brightness of your rising. The multitude with six of camels shall cover your land. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense and they shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. Now, we understand how it came that these Magi packed their, for their long and difficult journey through deserts and why they packed at this specific point in time. All things came together for them to undertake their journey. We need now to find out what the significance was of their journey and what message God has for us today from this. Now, ironically, these men discovered that the religious leaders in Jerusalem who knew the answer to where the Messiah would be born, they just didn't care. We don't read that the, the scribes and Pharisees and the priests that they joined the wise men from the east in visiting the newborn king in Bethlehem and honoring him. These learned men who were scholars of scriptures will know that what was prophesied, they were not interested in worship. Compared to the huge distance that the wise men from the east had to travel, the scribes and priests only had a short distance, just a neighboring town from Jerusalem, about nine kilometers per, on, on feet, uh, per feet to Bethlehem. But they didn't bother. And we need to learn from this. They were religious people. And we might be in church and be religious people, but we need to be acquainted with the King of Kings. We need to walk in a relationship to God in Jesus. We need not be complacent as these priests and scribes and Pharisees were. We need to be, to be zealous like the wise men from the East. Not knowing Jesus 
they could also not introduce others to him. Now what is also interesting is that even uh, having received a sign in nature, the star, or the appearance in the sky, about Jesus, these wise men still needed assistance from scriptures. They need to also consult scriptures. That was what happened here, because Herod called the scribes and these people, and they brought scriptures, and they read, and I've said now, now we're going to read this from Micah 5 verse 2, the prophecy of where the Messiah was to be born. Now this part of scripture the wise men did not have. They had other parts and they had the natural appearance or the supernatural appearance or in nature there was a guidance, but they still need guidance from the word of God. That's an important thing to note. They still needed scriptures to direct them to Jesus. Micah 5 verse 2, But you Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me, the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. So we may say that even God may use an extraordinary revelation. He brings us back to scripture so that we may meet the living word, God's Son. The way to God is through Jesus Christ and that He is revealed to us in the word of God. Now when they meet with God, these wise men, their response was worship. We learn from from that for our own encounter with God. We need to be sincere. We need to seek, to seek God diligently. We need to beware against mere religion. And we need to have a living relationship with God the Father through Jesus. Who we now follow as our King. Our lives are to bring honor and glory to our King. It's a life of worship. Now we still need to answer that question, remember. Why Matthew was sharing the gospel to Jews? Include the visit of Gentiles, of other nations, to bring honor to the Messiah in his gospel. Well, Matthew had to prepare the Jews for the mystery that Gentiles are now going to be included in God's kingdom. The Jews were still living in this old era where they were used that going through their laws and their traditions, they are in line with God's promises. But that time is coming to an end and God from the beginning intended the gospel to go out to all nations. We remember in Genesis 12 that he told Abram that he would bless him to be a blessing to all nations. Now therefore we do read in Matthew of the likes of these wise men coming from other nations of the east but we also read of the Roman um, centurion servant that was healed by Jesus in Matthew and is all part of preparing the Jews that Gentiles are now included in coming into God's kingdom and they must accept them but they must not fall behind. They must see the vastness of God's plan and they must also be sincere like these wise men were even though they had not all their spiritual insights. Um, so it was a closure of an era, the beginning of a new era, the age of the church. There is still much more to analyze in this text. Uh, Nalerian Ian suggested that I make mention of something new. 
let that star also rise. Who would like to create an opportunity at, at Morletta Park congregation to have um, a situation where we can together delve deeper into scriptures and to have a Bible school making use of English as language. And I'm going to do a little marketing slot, I'm giving a little glimpse of what sort of thing we, how we can, can dig a little bit deeper to come to a, a under, better understanding of scriptures. So let's do one or two examples. Let us read the text carefully and, and responsibly and take a look at some popular assumptions and see whether we understand them correctly. And is this applying to the piece of scripture that we have read today? Now let's read Matthew 2 verse 11. And when they had come in, into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother. Now, um, well, first we can say, you know, in looking to Christmas cards, we sometimes get another picture of baby Jesus uh, lying in the manger and three wise men from the east with the three gifts coming there. But it's not what the text is really saying. We need to, to keep odds um, distinct from one another and uh, read what every, every piece wants to, to, to tell us. Now from Luke 2 verse 12, the words from the angel to the shepherds was that Jesus would be born in a manger. Now he doesn't say that the manger was in a stable or in a barn. In Matthew 2 verse 8, we also read of the young child. Not a baby anymore. We also read that Herod inquired when the wise men had seen the star when they were still in the east. Probably they saw the star when Jesus was born. But then they still had to plan their journey and they still had to travel the long distance to Jerusalem. And the journey probably would at least have taken a month. But in the end it might have taken with all the preparations, etc., etc., several months, even a year or a little more than a year. That is what could have elapsed before they arrived in Bethlehem. And we know this from Matthew 2 verse 16, which says that Herod killed boys from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men, when they saw the star while they were still in the east. So you may see that this is not the scenario when the night that he was born and the shepherds and the angel and the manger, this is most probably between one and two years later. And we also find that he is mentioned to be in a house and he was a young child, not a baby anymore. Uh, indeed, Matthew 2 verse 1 just says after Jesus was born in Bethlehem. It doesn't say how long after. And then the old wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. So how are we now to understand the scenario with the house? Did they move from a barn to a house? Was there another um, solution? Let me show you some sketches of how first century Israel houses looked like. It is portrayed as having two stories. On the ground level, and you may see there on the screen, there would be typically an area where the animals, a room where the animals could be brought in for the night. Um, so it was part of the house on, on the ground level. And, and in this room or this area compartment, you, you, you would find mangers where um, the animals could just eat some straw or something. Um, but 
Also on the ground level, sometimes a little bit elevated, maybe um, a meter or so higher, you'll find the family who owns the house living there have uh, uh, bedrooms and living rooms and kitchen on the same level in the house on, on the bottom bottom compartment or bottom uh, ground floor level. But if you go up one level, you'll find some guest rooms and sometimes it may even be on the roof. So in Luke 2 verse 7, we read that Mary lay Jesus in a manger because there was no room for them in, in the inn. Now, how may we understand this? Now, if we look closer, we see that the word, the word in Greek used here for in is kat, katalima. It may also be translated as guest room. Now, there's another place where we read about an in. We can go to Luke 10, 34 and 35, where, where Jesus told us the parable of the Good Samaritan. And we see that there the Good Samaritan uh, brought the man that he helped to an inn on the road between Jericho and Jerusalem. And there was an innkeeper. But this word for inn is a different word in the Greek. It's the word pandukaion. So the inn with Joseph and Mary may not have been a, 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 a inn where you pay money to, to sleep the night. It might be, might be the guest room of the house, the upper room of the house. And it might be the same house that they originally stayed in because it's probable that Joseph and Mary visited some relatives of theirs when they came from Nazareth to Bethlehem. But because of all the people coming there for the census and the Feast of Tabernacles, the guest rooms were already full, occupied. And although the family would like to help them, they could not. And they had to make room for them um, in the bottom area, uh, in the compartment where the animals were used to sleep. And it doesn't say that the animals were present when they, they slept there. It, it doesn't say that. We, we just assume that it might be, but it might not be like that. They might, clear, might have cleared out the animals outside while uh, Joseph and Mary were sleeping in that area. Um, when this feast was done, of course, all the visitors returned home, but Joseph and Mary remained there. We remember that on day eight, they had to go to the temple for the circumcision and so forth, and they had to come back and they, they kept on staying there and they might have now moved from the bottom area to the top area to the guest room, the inn, at the same family, the relatives that they were staying. And they had to stay there because God had a plan uh, and the, the coming of the wise men was part of God's plan. So God asked them probably to stay there and they, therefore they, they most probably were staying still in the same house. That he might not have been born in a stable or a barn, but in the area of the house at the bottom where the animals were sleeping um, at some times. Then we also read in verse 11, it says, when they had come into the house, these are the wise men, come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary's mother and fell down and worshipped him. It might only have been Mary present at this time with Jesus. It doesn't mention anything necessarily about Joseph, but they worshipped who? Jesus. Not Mary, not the parents, but Jesus. Mary also had to worship Jesus because he was her king as well. The Son of God, the Messiah, that is an everlasting kingdom. Now there, there's another possible misconception, and I've already mentioned that, the idea that there were only three of these wise men. Uh, and we maybe assume that because of the three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, if you assume that each man brought one gift. But this is a very improbable deduction because um, of the importance of these men, 
they, they were noble men. They travel, traveled very far and it was dangerous with these precious um, uh, uh, gifts that they brought with. They had to have uh, some bodyguards that they were most probably a, a huge entourage of people with their tents they had to camp along the way to sleep over they had to have food supplies they came with animals um, bodyguards cooks so it might have been quite a crowd of people it's reckoned that it may have been several hundred of people in this um, caravan coming to jerusalem and you should imagine a big crowd of people and not only the three lonely men. Um, we also see that their visit caused a big uproar in Jerusalem. You can imagine this procession through the streets of Jerusalem and later coming to Bethlehem. I hope that this information would create a longing in all of us to get to know and understand our Bible better. And through it, we get to know our God and his message for us better as well. Not like the scribes and the Pharisees who were indifferent to having a relationship with God, but rather like the Magi, who even though there were things in their lives that needed to be addressed, at least they were sincere and they were seeking um, in a sincere, genuine way to meet the Most High King in the universe. And let us be wise men and women as well. Now let us conclude. The wise men portray people from all the nations that during the church age will come into the kingdom of God through worshipping and following Jesus Christ as King. They arrived in Bethlehem bringing valuable gifts to this King, the wise man, and knelt down and worshipped him as King. But Jesus was not an earthly King. And we may ask, did they, the wise men, inquire about what the child's name is? Did they inquire what the name Jesus mean? Jesus means Yahweh is the Savior, for He will save His people from their sins. Did they confess their sins? They brought earthly treasures, but did they return with heavenly treasures in their hearts? We trust that they did, but what about us? These are the most important questions we should also ask ourselves today. Let that be a message to each and every one of us. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we worship you in Jesus. Jesus is our King. Jesus is the Messiah, the Anointed One from God. The plan that you had that the whole world may be reconciled with God, the whole world including all the nations, the great mystery. Thank you, Lord, that you have made this wonderful plan and that you have communicated it to us that it's written down in the pages of scriptures and also even we found verification and testimonies about it in other historian literature as well. It all comes together, your revelation that you love us and that we may walk with you and worship you and have life and that in abundance, and that forevermore. The eternal kingdom, where the eternal king and his kingdom will never pass away. Thank you that we may be part of your kingdom under the rulership of your Messiah King, Jesus Christ our Lord. 
in your name. Amen. Thank you. It's great.